Okay, welcome everyone to today's University of Texas Energy Symposium on October 18th, 2022. Before we introduce today's speaker, I would like to point out to you the upcoming talks for our speaker series. Next week, we will have James or Jim Hamilton, who's professor of economics at the University of California, San Diego, talking about energy prices in the world economy. He's one of the world's experts on understanding econometrics and energy interactions with the economy. Uh, and then the week after that, we will have Erica Bierschbach, who is the Vice President of Energy Market Operations and Resource Planning at Austin Energy, your local electric utility here in Austin, Texas. And she will talk about the pros and cons of being a municipal utility. So we'll hear somewhat the perhaps opposite perspective today from our speaker today. Uh, I am not going to introduce today's speaker. I will let uh, Dr. Michael Weber in the Mechanical Engineering Department uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Jan Mertens. Michael, go ahead. Great, thank you. So I'm Michael Weber, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and longtime friend and collaborator and colleague of Kerry King. So it's uh, good to be here today to help introduce another friend and colleague, Dr. Jan Mertens. Some of you know, I took leave from the University of Texas from 2018 to 2021 to move to Paris, France to serve as Chief Science and Technology Officer for ENGIE, which is a very large electric and gas utility and infrastructure services company. And as a part of the research team there is Dr. Jan Mertens, Chief Science Officer, who had been at NG Research for a few years by that point and then was promoted to Chief Science Officer, where he still holds the title today. He's also a professor at uh, Ghent University. He got his PhD in environmental engineering from KU Leuven. He's lived and worked in different countries around the world, including New Zealand, and he grew up in Kenya learning Swahili. So if you want to ask him any questions in Swahili, feel free to do that. He and I have co-authored some papers and different projects together, though I'm no longer at NG. I'm back at the University of Texas. I'm still a collaborator of his working on the Science Advisory Council, and we will have him on campus actually in January. So if some of you like his talk and want to meet him in person, you might have that chance. Um, this talk is about CO2. You'll hear more about that. And he's uh, building this off a lot of his work and life cycle analysis and things he's done. So Jan, thanks for the time and sharing some of your wisdom with us at the University of Texas. And I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks for this great and very personal introduction, Michael. I'll try to share my screen now. I hope that it works. It works. Okay. Oops. All right. It's it works. Uh, we don't see the full screen yet. I will. Uh, I'd like to point out to the viewers: if you want to send a question, send it at any time, and I will interject the question in the middle of Jan's presentation. But, uh, All right. Do you see still, the full screen? No, we do not see the full screen. Okay. So you see the, my presentation view, is that it? Your presentation, yes, but not as full screen, yeah. So you see the presenter's mode is? is that uh, no, we see the slide as if you were editing the PowerPoint. Oh, really? But you could maybe pull that bar on the left over to the left so we don't see your upcoming slides if you don't want. Yeah, let me try to share my screen again. And you could also zoom in on it if you want to make it bigger. All right, I'll just do it like this, I think. I guess now you see the full screen? Now we see the presenter view. You could, in this view right now, just zoom in if you want. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't see what you see, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> OK, now, now I think you should see if I put this in print. It's a little uh, full screen now? It's a little too big for the screen, so it's a little cut off in the bottom right corner. It's full screen, but yeah, cut off, so it wasn't in our prep session. No, it was good in our prep session, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah. This, is, this is why we love Zoom, right? Okay. Last. There we go. That what is about it. this? 
Yep, that's oh, it. Right. That was great. All right, thank you very much, and I apologize for this. So, um, thank you for having me. So, I'm the Chief Science Officer at, N at NG, um, and and the title maybe sounds a little bit provocative um, from um, from the start, but but I'm I'm sure that um, that after this talk, you will uh, or we will all love the alien, and and I will try to explain you how I think that CO two actually deserves a bit of our affection, um, actually a lot of our affection, and it's it's right that we are uh, we are rightly obsessed with it. But I do think we should also save a seat for some other surprising um, climate change um, um, allies. I'll talk a little bit about engine energy research. Then I'll talk a lot about the three pathways towards carbon neutrality, how we think um, at NG that we can reach this carbon neutrality, uh, which we're after by 2045, by 2050, in order to meet the, the two degrees, eh, the two degree scenario, to come up why, um, why it's not all about CO2 and or some other climate change allies, as I like to call them that we should think about as we go towards this carbon neutrality and end with some conclusion. So Michael already said it, Engie, it's a, it's a huge company. We want to be the leader in the, in the energy transition. Um, and, and so we are about 100,000 people um, spread out worldwide. Um, of course, a lot in, in Europe, um, most of it in Europe. But North America is a, is a really growing stronghold country, as it is called today, also in South America. So we're active worldwide mainly on four core activities, a lot on renewables, a lot of wind and solar, but also um, hydropower in, um, in Brazil, for example, a lot on networks. So this means mainly gas networks, a little bit of electricity networks, um, a lot of energy solutions, energy solutions. So this is helping our clients, in fact, helping the industry um, to become carbon neutral um, by reaching their targets. And then, of course, also some thermal production as to some gas turbines um, and some other um, energy supplies this is also where our hydrogen work is, is found into is found in today. So we as, as a, I think we're not very different from our colleagues by stating that we want to be net zero carbon. So this is not zero carbon. Eh? This is net zero carbon because as I, I will explain to you. I think we should love the carbon and love the CO2 so we cannot do without it. But we should try to be um, we should achieve to become net zero or carbon neutral, as we like to call it, by 2045. What is different? So this a lot of companies have claiming. What is different, I think, um, with our claim is that we want to not only do it on scope one and two of our emissions, but also scope three. So what is scope three emissions? So scope one emissions, I think most of you may know this, eh? but scope one emissions, this is emissions from directly our activities. Eh? So this is the emissions from our gas turbines, from our um, assets. Then scope two is very little for energy, of course, as an electricity company. We purchase very little electricity ourselves, so this is nothing. But scope three, this is where um, a lot of our emissions are, because these are our emissions due to the products that we sold to our clients, due to the electricity and the gas mainly that we sell to our clients. So um, all the uh, clients, the industrial clients from NG, the chemical companies, the, the cement companies, the steel companies, that buy our energy. In fact, the emissions at their site coming from our products that we sold them, coming from our fuels, are our scope three emissions. And so NG has claimed that it wants to be carbon neutral, not only on scope one and two, as most of our colleagues do, but also on, on scope three. And that is, of course, where the main challenge is, because if you look at where our emissions are today, out of the 190 million tons of CO2 that we emit every year, which is, which is enormous, of course, it's about 0.2% of the overall um, CO2 emissions, 70% of that is, um, is coming from our scope three emissions. So this, the, the, the challenge is, is huge, and it's particularly in this scope three emissions that we will need new emerging technologies, things like CCS, um, things like e-fuels, things like um, well, other uh, that I will talk about a lot in, in, in the upcoming talk will be needed to help our clients to actually decarbonize. Because making our, carbon, our electricity generation, for example, for carbon neutral, it's, it's not that hard. Eh? We've got PV and wind. It's cheaper than fossil. Making our industrial clients carbon neutral is a lot more challenging. And so for that, as I already said, we will need a lot of new technologies. Because if you have a look at the IEA scenario, let's take the scenario of net zero emissions by 2050. Eh? So the, this one in the middle here. <coughs> well, the IEA says that up to less than 25%, in fact, of the technologies that we will need to become carbon neutral by 2050 are mature today. All the others, either the green ones are being an early adopted, demonstrated, or in pilots. 
So it is clear that the challenge um, on upscaling these technologies from where they are now, I don't think we don't have to invent new physics or new chemistry. I mean, there's a lot out there that exists in research labs, at universities, in startups that we need to scale up very, very fast if we want to reach the, the ambition of, of, of carbon neutrality by, by 2050. If you zoom in only on the heavy industry, as I said before, and mainly our scope pre emissions or long distance transport, it's even worse. Eh? Less than 10% of the technologies are blue here, are mature, and all the others are still out there being, being researched on. So clearly, upscaling these emerging technologies is, is crucial. And that's, of course, why um, what in NG, we've got NG Research, eh, where we had a, we used to have Michael with us, um, where we have about 500 researchers um, and organized in 23 thematic labs. I will spare you all the details, but we've got a solar lab with people from uh, our lab close to Brussels in Belgium here, where I'm also based, but also people from, from Paris involved, but also people from Chile involved, where we have a large test bench on new solar technologies. We've got a hydrogen lab, a life cycle assessment lab, environment and society, energy system, robotics and drones, future industry, storage, and also an interesting one, as you see here, CO2 as a resource. So this idea um, that CO2 should not only be seen as an issue, I will try to explain later, but it could also be, or it should also be a, a, a research a resource. What do we do at NG Research? Typically, we're not the General Electric or the Siemens or the Vestas, or um, we don't typically develop technologies from scratch. Um, what we like to do is we like to partner with technology developers and help them scale up their technology as fast as possible. Of course, with the idea to give a competitive advantage to our business units. So for example, a nice example, which I always use is this bifacer solar testing in Chile, which we have been doing for over a decade now. Like we try to understand them. We don't build these things from scratch. We work with the manufacturers of these panels, but we try to understand, should they be vertical? Should they track the sun? Should we put something on the ground to increase the reflectivity towards the back of these panels? so that they can harvest light from, from both sides as, as they are designed to do. Today, we have handed this over to our business units. This is standard practice now um, when they do bits for large scale PV projects. So the idea is that we, we test things, we demonstrate things, of course, with the objective to move it as soon as possible to our business units to give them a competitive advantage when they're bidding for, um, for real scale projects. I'll let you discover the other ones, floating wind turbine. I'll talk a little bit about that one. High altitude, uh, high altitude airborne wind, but also things like power to methane are things that I will touch upon in, um, in, my, uh, in, in my talk. Enough about NG and NG research. Um, I'd like to focus on the three pathways toward carbon neutrality and the order is important. Eh? So how can we achieve this carbon neutrality by, by 2045 on our three scopes, just as a, as a reminder. And the first pathway, it's maybe an obvious one and everybody will say, ah, oh, but this is too obvious. Well, it is pretty obvious. And we've been doing it for decades, but we need to continue to do it. It's all about energy efficiency. So we need to do, try to do the same or even more with less energy and also think a little bit more circular where waste becomes a feedstock. And to give an example, just one example of this first very crucial pathway um, is, uh, for example, biogas, which is very high on our agenda, where you have your waste collection in the gas case you feed it to bacteria. It's pretty simple, very simple process. You get out your biogas, which you can upgrade to real biomethane if you want, which and inject it in the gas grid, or you can use it immediately. And so this idea of much more circular thinking and energy efficiency should remain uh, the, the very first pathway. And more efforts uh, than we do today should be, uh, should be, should be given to, to this. The second pathway, and that is something that everybody's talking about today is, of course, we should electrify, I'd like to say, as much as possible. A lot of people will say everything, um, I'd, I'd like to say uh, as much as possible, and I'll explain you why, far beyond just our electrical cars. So we should try to electrify as much as possible, not only our cars, but also industrial processes, which are electrifiable, should be electrified, because usually when you electrify, you actually, uh, at the same time, increase your energy efficiency because electrical um, driven or electricity as an energy vector is a lot more efficient than, than molecules, for example, or than other uh, uh, energy vectors. And this is good news here. Eh? We've been doing this very good at eh? the installation of much more renewable electricity. These are the world energy outlook predictions every year. And you actually see the black curve is what happened and all the other curves, which were the curves which the energy, um, International Energy Agency predicted. 
And you can see we've proven them wrong year after year. So year after year, we've been installing a lot more PV, a lot more photovoltaics than actually was predicted by the, by the IEA. And it's not only the IEA which was wrong, even the Greenpeace uh, people amongst us, who you can hardly call um, not optimistic with respect to renewable energy, of course, even them underestimated the growth as which we've been seeing for solar capacity, for example. So there is really some good news out there. And this is a, a, a recent, very recent published uh, publication from Ember, which showed that for the first time in 2021, actually wind and solar hit a world record of 10% of the global electricity. And I will show you, it's a nice um, uh, animation of, of the last 20 years, uh, starting in 2000, of the countries um, that, 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 that are installing more and more PV. And when here you see your Denmark and your Germany, as everybody knows, being among the pioneers and already <clears throat> surpassing the 10% as early as, as 2005. Then you see here as 2010, things really start to move worldwide. Eh? You see your, the USA here, for example, is really catching up by 2014. Uruguay, for some reason, um, is really up front there. But also here at China, Australia, Japan, so the Asian is, 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 really, um, is really moving forward now. And so by 2021, the average world is, um, is, is, is 10 percent. So this is really good news. And it's something that we need to continue to do, of course, if we want to reach this two degree scenario. In fact, what we need to continue to do is really continue to do what we have been doing in so far, which means that we need to continue to have a year on year growth of about 20 percent of wind and solar. So it means every year we need to install exactly the same as the year before, plus 20 percent. Of course, as you install more and more, this becomes more and more ambitious, but it's not something extraterrestrial if you want, because it, it is what we have been doing over the last two decades. Here you see we were a little bit less than 20%, here we're a little bit more. But if we can continue the same pace of up around 20%, we can actually reach this 1.5 or 2 degree scenario pathway um, is, is, is the good news what is, um, or what is behind this, this graph. And of course, <coughs> it will not only be the traditional wind and solar, and here I have added, for example, the bifacial PV panels, which I've shown you before. It's also we're looking into floating PV, of course, floating onshore on lakes. But why not also offshore? And these are projects, demonstrations that we're also running. Um, this is a pretty interesting um, uh, project that we have in Portugal, where we actually have a floating wind turbine. Um, I will not go through the entire movie, but you see here how this is, um, how this is actually made. This is the floater. Um, I'll put it a little bit more because I don't think you can hear the sound. But this is the floater being assembled um, of, on shore, of course, which is one of the main advantages that you can completely uh, manufacture and, and, and make, if you wish, the complete turbine on shore with the floater, put everything ready so that the only thing you have to do when it's ready is hook it up to a tow boat and it will actually tow this entire installation to the location in the sea where you can then anchor it to the to the seabed. And um, so here you see this is what, what's happening. Yeah? So you, at the night, they connect the entire uh, system. So the floater plus the turbine, they connect it to a towboat and they move it into the middle of the ocean um, where it is then installed using using anchors to the, to the ground. Of course, the main advantage is not only that it's a lot cheaper to install and manufacture the whole thing onshore than it is offshore, because offshore man hours are very, very expensive. And the main advantage, of course, is that you can now install these things in seabeds, which are a lot more deeper than the usually 50 meters that we use for a fixed um, offshore, offshore winter. And for example, for the US, um, this is really um, a good opportunity because in the US, uh, actually both the West and the East Coast, the sea becomes steep is, uh, the seabed is pretty steep close to the shore, so the seabed becomes pretty deep, quite close to the, the shore, which is not always the case here in Europe, where we have a lot of fixed offshore wind there, where we have a concrete uh, foundation. Um, in the US, it would be way too much expensive in many of the locations, so we think that this floating wind is really an opportunity for the, for the US to kick off even more the, the, the wind power for the places close to the, close to the shore. And then we've also got airborne wind if you wish so these are um new type of wind turbines if you wish but they look like kites well they are kites 
So you leave, you you have them go up very high into the into the sky eh, where the wind speeds are a lot higher and a lot more constant, eh, which means that your capacity factor, as we call it, or the time that they produce electricity over the year is a lot higher than for a normal wind turbine. They also use less material. Of course, you can imagine these are flying objects. There are challenges related to its, um, to its operation. But a lot of startups are working on this. I'll put a few here. And we're also testing one of them, which is the sky sales example, um, which we're testing in, in, in Germany at the, at the moment. So the good news is we need to continue to do this 20% year on year growth. We've got the traditional solar, traditional wind. And at the same time, we see emerging technologies that I believe can help prove the roadmaps even longer than we are proving them today. But of course, it's not only about the production. And I added this slide just to show that energy management systems eh, or trying to consume the energy when it is produced will be crucial eh, because these renewable technologies, they don't always produce <coughs> electricity. PV doesn't produce when it's dark. There's not always wind. So there will be a need for a lot of energy management systems trying to consume the energy when it's available and trying to store it when it's abundant and trying to get it out of the storage when we need it and there is no productions. So things like what we like to call vehicle to grid, so using your batteries from your electrical cars to, to, to provide electrons to the grid, but also vehicle to home are things that, that clearly will need to help in stabilizing the, 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 the grid. These are just a few of the, of the examples that we're, we're running today. And of course, storage, large case storage, um, will, will, will be crucial um, to, to help us do this as well. Jan, uh, this is Kerry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we talked about interjecting with questions, and I'm, I'm there sure, are a few that's great. on the list if you'd like. So, um, perfect. Uh, one of them going back to your item number one on the slide here. So, <clears throat> this is what is uh, NG's plan to overcome the energy efficiency paradox to reach net zero. So, let's you, you mentioned circularity here with your item number one of increasing energy efficiency. So do you see that as necessary to overcome the idea that as we get more efficient, we consume more? Or how, how do you think about that? Oh, is that what you refer to as the energy efficiency paradox? That uh, yeah, or the backfire effect or the Jevons paradox, I guess is the, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, we do talk a lot with an NG um, also about energy sobriety. Is that also a concept that is living at the moment in, in the US? So it's a lot of the younger generation are actually um, thinking a bit, lot more than, than the older generation is. We should be a lot more sober with our energy. So at the same time, I understand the paradox that you're talking about, but I also see that the younger generation is thinking a lot more about this um, than, um, than, than we used to do before. So. In the end, I'm, I'm not so sure whether it will be the paradox or whether it will be the sobriety or whether they will cancel um, um, each other out. It's, um, I, think, I think time will tell. What I do see in, in cities, for example, in large cities in Europe, in Paris, for example, it has become like, like I think, in the US 10 years or 20 years ago, one of your status symbols as a person was the size of your truck, of your car, right? What you see now, in, and this used to be the same in, in Europe, maybe not to that extent, but still, what you see now is that the status symbol of a lot of young people living in these cities, it's actually their bike in which they can carry their three children around, um, you know, which they can do groceries with. It's not so cool anymore to even have a car, uh, and certainly not a, a petrol car. Um, so you see that, that, that there is this, this notion and also the status symbol is moving away from large cars to really nice, in many cases, electrical bikes, which, um, which, which cost almost as much. So it's not about the cost. It's really about changing um, the way that they see the future of, of, of the energy and, and the climate change. So I'd have no straight answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. That's OK. We got a couple more questions if you want to take them now. Um, yeah, sure. The one is uh, perhaps related to what you just said. We we see more electric bikes here in Austin as well, certainly over the, over the last couple of years. So there's a question here about scaling, electrification in general. And you mentioned that NG has a life cycle assessment group. So this is sort of the question about, you know, uh, quantifying the full life cycle, carbon greenhouse gas life cycle of renewable electricity or perhaps bikes uh, and cars and all these kinds of things. So 
How significant do you think is uh, an issue of dealing with the full life cycle of uh, greenhouse gases for electrification? Uh, and do you think it's you know outweighed by going renewable? Or you know, do you have any conclusions yeah. on that? If you talk about greenhouse gases, then I'm sure we're doing a good job with renewables. I I am saving some slides on the um, allies that I will not reveal now, but I do think there's probably larger um, uh, impacts of going to renewable electricity than um, than, than than the CO2 that is <clears throat> released during the production of these PV panels or during the production of your of your wind. Uh, I will not reveal them now, but I just say that it's crucial. To <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, to think um, life cycle assessment far beyond just the greenhouse gas or the global warming potential, as we call it in life cycle assessment. But I'll come to that uh, very soon. Okay, I'll interject again. Here's one on the the floating wind turbines that you showed uh, a few slides ago. Um, do you, do you think that um, floating wind turbines or offshore wind will sort of become dominant or overtake the amount of wind power we have on land? And uh, if yes, when might you expect that to happen? Well, for sure, for countries like, like, like Belgium, for example, where I live, it's already the case today. That we've got far more wind turbines offshore and a lot more gigawatt offshore than we have onshore just because we don't have that much space onshore. Um, so we have a lot of what we call fixed um, bottom or, or fixed offshore wind turbines, meaning that they have a foundation. But we're lucky because we've got sand bands so the depth of the sea is only about 20 meters. So it's not that expensive to go offshore. In fact, what is expensive is, is the offshore substations to increase the voltage and the cable that goes to the, to, to, to the, to the shore. But, but, but offshore, going offshore as such is, is not that expensive, or it is a little bit more expensive. But the capacity factors are higher. The machines that are used are usually a lot bigger. So I, I'm a strong believer that we will see much more going um, offshore of, of these wind turbines. And also in the US, if we can get this floating wind turbines to work and, and to become a little bit more cheaper as today, because there are still some challenges related mainly to the operation of the wind turbines. You can imagine it's not that easy to control them as you have big waves. Um, there are still some technical challenges left. But yes, I think we will see offshore um, wind booming in the, in the coming years. Okay, I'll I'll just throw a word in your ear, but and you can continue on and address it perhaps later. But uh, asking the, the nuclear question and how does NG think about nuclear is one of these as well. So you can maybe hold okay. on that or, or discuss now, or maybe you have something on it later. So I'll let you go ahead from now. No, I don't have anything on later. I will treat it very very fast now. Maybe this is somebody who knows the situation in Belgium. Um, NG um, was being asked or had been asked by the government to um, to quit nuclear by, by 2025. So NG only has uh, two nuclear power plants in Belgium, um, which are still running today, um, but which should stop by 2025. Uh, there are now, as you can imagine, with the Russian war, um, the price of the gas and the electricity are just have grown, increased by a factor 10 now. So there are currently discussions ongoing between the government and NG to see if some of these nuclear cannot uh, be um, be extended at the same time we should also look maybe at new nuclear which is not we're not technology developers but we're just keeping an eye open on things like small modular reactors why not on nuclear fusion if you see what's the number of startups that that are working now in this field it used to be something for the the research nerds playing with public money but this is clearly changing now there is private money going into into nuclear fusion. So that may speed up this development as well. We're not part of these developments, but we're keeping an eye on it. Okay, I'll continue with the, the third the third pathway. Sorry, is that okay? Go ahead. Perfect. So I will try to show, I mean, this is not only me, but but after we have elect after we have increased the energy efficiency, and then after we've electrified whatever we can electrify, I think there is a scientific consensus now that we will need molecules. Um, to complete this, uh, this to, to go towards completely carbon neutrality. And this is depicted from a group in Potsdam in, in Germany, a uh, publication in Nature from the end of last year. Um, so again here, I'm sorry for repeating, but I think it's important. First pathway is increasing efficiency, electrified. And a third one is we need these molecules. And this is also what's depicted here by this group published in, in Nature at the end of last year. 
they calculated the marginal abatement cost. So how much does it cost to stop emitting a ton of CO2 um, for different sectors? And here you have your light road, your cars. Here you have your space heating, some of the industry. Here you have your more heavy industry, eh, your high temperature here. Here you have your aviation and your shipping. And clearly what they show is that if you can do it with electricity, you probably should. Because it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot more efficient, as I said before. But when you reach this point, for example, here, high temperature heat in the industry, aviation, shipping, long distance transport of energy, long term storage of energy, seasonal storage, for example, there is no way we can do that using electrons. We will need to convert these electrons in what I like to refer to as as molecules for what is this up to like at least one third of the energy consumption will not be able to do it directly with electricity. So we'll need to convert this electricity into what we call molecules. And then, of course, the first molecule that everybody's talking about today, and, and maybe rightly so, is, um, is, uh, is hydrogen, of course. And there are a lot of ways to get access to, to low carbon hydrogen. Eh? So again, you only need to go to hydrogen after you've increased your energy efficiency, after you've increased your electricity, or whether you checked where you cannot do it with electricity, if you can't, and probably hydrogen is a good candidate. And of course, we've got green hydrogen, eh, where we do water splitting again with renewable electricity. So for hydrogen, we will need, at least for green hydrogen, even much more renewable electricity eh, related to the question before. But you can also do it from, as we do it today, eh, from natural gas. You make it react with steam. Eh? We call it steam methane reforming. Um, today, the CO2 is just emitted, but you could think of capturing the CO2 and storing it away. So this is what we'd like to call blue hydrogen, but you can also have a more exotic one, the turquoise hydrogen. So you see they've all got different colors where you actually paralyze your natural gas and you turn it into hydrogen and a solid CO2. So you end up with solid carbon. And in this case, you can even think about pink hydrogen is what they call it when you use renewable, uh, when you use, sorry, nuclear electricity to do your water splitting. So there's a lot of ways to get access to to hydrogen and where your electricity doesn't work, probably hydrogen is a good first candidate you should look into. There is, however, a big challenge with hydrogen. And this is, um, so yeah, I will let you discover all these colors of hydrogen on this slide. I will not talk to them. But what, what, what I will um, try to explain is that hydrogen is a really good candidate, a really good molecule, if you don't have to transport or move it, which in many cases, I believe we will have to do. So this is from a paper, a joint paper between me and Michael, for example, is um, um, how can we transport 10 kilowatt hour of energy? Well, you can do that in one liter of diesel or petrol. So petrol and diesel um, are very, very energy dense. No, it's not without a reason that we've been using these so efficiently over the last um, many decades. Um, but if you go to hydrogen, for example, first of all, doing it with batteries, you need to transport 27 times that same volume. So batteries to store or to transport energy for long distances or long periods, it's it's not it's not going to work. But even with hydrogen, if you compress it to 350 bars, it's about 13 times the same amount of volume that you need to move around. If you go even higher to 700 bars, it's still seven times the same uh, the same amount of volume that you need to transport instead of your um, your hydrocarbons here. And you can even make it liquid, eh? just as we do with natural gas, and so we liquefy natural gas down to minus 160 degrees. Then we have 1.7 liters that we need to carry around. We know how to do this pretty efficiently today. For hydrogen, we need to go down to minus 250 degrees. And by doing so, we don't know how to do that very efficiently yet today. We lose up to 35% of the energy content in our hydrogen to make it liquid. And even then, we still need to move or store four times that same amount of, of, of energy. So this is why we think um, that hydrogen will be a, a molecule where you can use it immediately or very close to the place where it's produced or where you have gas transport lines. Eh? So gas infrastructure, gas uh, pipelines, there probably, it probably does have a future if you need to transport it over longer distances or longer periods. Um, we think we will need to go to synthetic hydrocarbons. So taking this hydrogen, make it react with the CO2, which is why I think we should love CO2, and use it as a resource to turn it back into a methane or a gas or, or a diesel, if, if you wish. And so these are some slides that I borrowed from, um, from Michael. Um, what we should stop doing is what we're doing today, eh? taking methane or natural gas or oil or whatever fossil fuel out of the ground, 
burn it in our infrastructure for heat or electricity, because of course we end up with the CO2, which is of course part of causing climate change. I think we all agree that for up to one third of the energy, we still need um, these molecules. So there we've got no other choice if we still need them, but we can't take them out of the ground anymore, is we have to synthesize them, to make them. So that we can do um, using um, uh, CO2. We capture the CO2. You can take it out of the air or from a point source or from biomass, make it react with water. In many cases with hydrogen, you will first use your renewable electricity sp to split your water into a hydrogen and an oxygen. Take the hydrogen, make it react with your CO2 over a chemical catalyst or using bacteria. There are bacteria that can ferment pretty well CO2 and hydrogen into your gas, into your methane molecule, which now we no longer call natural gas, but we call it synthetic gas, to do exactly the same what we cannot do today here with, uh, with direct electricity. And in this case, at least, we can reach this carbon neutrality, which we're all after by, by 2045. And part of the CO2 to really reach the 1.5 degree scenario, we will need a little bit of carbon capture and storage as well, take it out of the atmosphere and, and, and store it away. So this is why these type of, of projects are very high on our agenda um, within, within NG. This is, for example, a power to methanol project in Antwerp here in Belgium, where we have hydrogen. In this case, we've got a, a, a waste stream. We're lucky and we do part water splitting with renewable electricity. We make the hydrogen react with CO2. In this case, it's captured from a flue gas to produce our methanol, which we can then use either as a chemical feedstock or as a, or as a fuel. Um, so this is just one of the projects. We've got many, many more. Um, also for power to kerosene, for example, eh? because the aviation is really in need of sustainable fuels. And one way is you take CO2 and hydrogen over another catalyst and you do a Fischer Tropsch, um, what is called a chemical uh, synthesis of, uh, of, in this case, your uh, your kerosene, where you can then use to uh, to fly your, your planes, your, uh, your aviation. So I hope I convinced you that we should um, we should love the alien eh, or, or show some affection for CO2, but I promise to go a little bit deeper also and, and to save a seat for, um, for other climate change um, um, allies. And the first one, um, there is somebody here who is a, a lot better to talk about this one than myself, but I think um, we should really save a seat as we go along to this carbon neutrality for, uh, for water. So it's not all about CO2. Water is the first climate change ally that I would like to, I'd like to talk about. Uh, a very nice slide again um, from, from Michael, in fact. So in, in the US, you've been using this proverb for, uh, for many decades, it seems. So whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. And also for the energy transition that we're living through, our pathway to carbon neutrality, water will be, water will be crucial. And it is crucial already today. As we speak, or at least from one month ago, we had really droughts in Europe. Eh? For example, in Norway, there were shortages of electricity. In Europe, ADF, eh? so our nuclear power plants, and we had not ours, it's not NG's, it's, it's EDF, but the nuclear power plants in France had to stop because the river temperatures were too high because of the, 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 the heat wave. So this is not something um, that will happen, that only happened in the past, that will only happen in the future. It will continue to happen as we speak on our renewable, but also on our fossil based uh, assets. And even for, for hydrogen, uh, this will become crucial because we need about nine kilograms of pure clean water to produce your one kilogram of of hydrogen, just to show you how serious we take LCA. This is a, pre, a publication from last year where we uh, assess the environmental impacts of hydrogen production from wind electricity in, in the Netherlands. Um, so this is this having access to clean water for our hydrogen economy is, is crucial. And you can say, oh, but it's not that much. How much water do we need for hydrogen? It's only about 25 uh, billion cubic meters compared to what we consume in the agriculture. It's peanuts. And it's true, eh? it's not that much if you look in the absolute figures. The trouble is, or the catch is, as Irina calls it in their recent report, is that we will need this water mainly in these areas where you'll have cheap, abundant renewable electricity, mainly PV. And so this is in areas where there's a lot of sunshine, where the air solar iteration is really high. And these usually do not coincide with, your, uh, uh, with, where, with, with having access to a lot of um, uh, clean, pure, clean, clean water. So although it's not that much in absolute values, there is a real challenge in still getting access to it. And of course, water desalinization can help in some cases, uh, but, it, but, but in other cases, we will need to think of other ways of getting access to, to pure clean, clean water. The second um, 
climate change ally, and this is particularly true for wind and RPV, um, is, is we should give a lot more attention to, to what I call like the critical materials. This is a slide from a publication from the IEA last year, where they, they show you how many of these minerals, eh, copper, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, graphite, I will spare you the names, but if you look into an electrical car compared to a conventional car, you need up to six times that amount of materials per kilogram, uh, or six times um, much many, six times more materials per vehicle in an electrical car as compared to a conventional car. And even for power generation, it is it is the same. If you look at onshore wind and your solar PV, you need between two and three times more of these minerals. Um, as compared to your coal or your nuclear or, or your natural gas. So clearly, if we want to um, make this energy transitions towards carbon neutrality um, sustainable, we also need access, uh, sustainable access to, um, to, to these materials. So there's the first problem of, of not having enough. Eh? And there the IEA clearly sees, let's take the example of cobalt or lithium, this is the two degree scenario or the sustainable development scenario as they call it. So this is the amount of cobalt that we will need to reach this two degree scenario. And this is what the IEA sees in operating mines, the darker shaded area in new mines. This is what they believe will come available from new mines. There's clearly there is a discrepancy between what we will need and what we will have access to. So the first challenge related to materials is about this, what we call criticality. It's about not having enough. And of course, their recycling and substantivity. Yeah? So doing the same thing, or maybe a little bit less efficient, but with a, a, a mineral or with a material that is less critical. I think those are two solutions that need to be happen very fast to close this, this discrepancy. So it's about recycling and substantivity. But it's not only about um, <clears throat> not having enough. I think the second thing we need to take care about is to do it a little bit probably cleaner uh, than we do today. Um, this is another issue. Uh, there's a geopolitical issue. I forgot about this, but where there's a discrepancy um, between where the metals are produced. Um, so these are produced, for example, this is cobalt. Well, up to 70% actually comes from one country, which is, which is Congo, the rare earths. There, China is really dominating. But if you look at where they are processed, so here you can say, oh, it's quite monopolistic already where they are produced. But if you look at where they're processed, there you can see that today China is dominating in all of these in all of these minerals. So clearly it's about having enough and also about geopolitical issues. And then the second thing, it's also about we should probably do it a little bit cleaner, thinking much more about the environment. I like this picture because it shows a big digger um, that accidentally took up a, a bulldozer. So you can imagine the amount of energy that is consumed in these mining activities is just it's just enormous, and this is today, in many cases, not renewable electricity, of course. But it's not only, again, it's not only about the, the energy or the CO2 emissions related to this. Uh, probably equally important in these kind of installations is um, the environmental aspects related to water use, again, water, uh, but also pollution, the use chemicals. So again, um, we need to think about um, the LCA of these mining activities and probably do it a, a little bit better than we do today. So it's about criticality maybe not having enough and a geopolitical issue. It's about the environmental issue. And then the third one, that we know that there are also some social issues related to some of these minerals like cobalt. Since it comes for 70% from Congo, we know that, for example, child labor is something that is, um, that is actually taking place as, as still as we speak. And of course, if we want to take this carbon neutrality and the sustainability of it um, serious, we need to think about these issues much more than we do today. This is why, for example, with the University of Ghent, where I teach, last year we did for the first time, it's a social life cycle assessment, eh, where you try to do a social uh, impact um, of, in this case, it was a Tesla battery. Uh, so the, 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 the cobalt came from the DRC, Congo, the lithium from, uh, lithium from Chile, then it was manufactured or assembled in, in the USA, it was shipped to Belgium, and then used in Germany, and then the end of life it was going to Ghana. So we look at all these um, set factors um, and, and try to understand in a qualitatively way. We don't have quantitative measures yet today, but, but you see this is an emerging field of, um, of research and I think crucial if we want to take this carbon neutrality or this pathway towards carbon neutrality um, um, series. So I will conclude here in the hope that we've got some time left for questions. 
So um, I hope I've convinced you that we should show some affection to CO2, that clearly materials is something that we need to think about as we go along towards those carbon neutrality. And, and, and here, um, um, water is the second climate change ally that I, that, I, that I talked about. So if you want to read a little bit more about new emerging sustainable technologies, I will do a little bit of marketing here. Every year we publish um, openly, um, and if you click on the link, it will take you there. You can download them. Um, what we think are emerging sustainable technologies that could again help to prove these roadmaps wrong. Um, if we scale them up very fast, um, probably we can we can do a lot better than than um, than the five, four, twelve um, announcements that are being made and that are important. I don't want to minimize this, but here we try to present some of the technologies that could make a difference and help speed up our pathway towards carbon neutrality. So you're free to download them if you are, if you ever am, am interested. So I will stop here. Um, Carry if, if that's okay, and maybe take some um, some questions or some remarks or some comments or. Uh, thank you. We do have some questions. Uh, no, Michael, you have a, a comment first before we go to questions. Otherwise, I'll just go to it. No, I I did have a question. I put in our chat. I wasn't able to put it in Q and A. Just want to make sure you don't miss that one. After okay. I don't know if you're yeah none. So there's a few in here. Uh, oh yeah, I see your your chat question. Um, so yeah, it's a question of um, any opportunities to work with Anji since we have a university full of students here studying energy things and uh, any opportunities, I guess, I don't know, in the US or in Europe to uh, internship I, I, these I, kind of things. I think it's possible in both, at least. I don't know what, but I think it's the same in, in, in the US. Today we are living in a in what we call a war of talent. Eh? Um, we are we are short of, um, of, of engineers, of, of business people, of to help us um, speed up this this energy transition, so there's clearly um, if there's interest, feel free to reach out and we'll see what is possible. We do have a uh, in 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 Houston. Eh? We've got a, a people in in Houston and of course all over Europe. Um, there are also probably possibilities that we could look into. Very well. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a couple questions, maybe on the same rough topic here of. Geothermal. So, what does NG think about geothermal electricity or geothermal energy? And then there's one here, a little bit more detailed, perhaps. Thoughts on CO2 plume geothermal uh, or carbon dioxide as a working fluid? Uh, it's maybe a little bit more advanced technology, but you're the chief science officer, so <laughs> maybe they're throwing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Um, so the first one was: Does NG think about geothermal? Yeah, we think about geothermal, and we work. On geothermal, but only so not on what what I refer to. I don't know how you call it in the US, but we don't work on deep geothermal, or at least we've stopped. Um, we've stopped working on on, on deep, deep geothermal. So we work on geothermal for uh, for heat pumps, for example, for building heating or for even district heating. Um, we do think about geothermal, and we work on heat pumps uh, using a, um, water uh, water water or, or other kind of um, of heat pumps. But we've stopped working on the deeper geothermal um, uh, yeah, topic or, or, um, or research. I don't know. This was a, a, a more of a, a political decision than, than a really um, uh, research-based decision, I think. But of course, we need to focus sometimes. And so recently, this was one of, one of the decisions that, that we do not continue to work building projects on deep geothermal. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> OK. Um, let's Go to this one oh, here. The second, uh, uh, the second one was CO2 as a working fluid? Uh, yeah, it was a little oh, bit yeah. more of, and they were asking in the context of uh, geothermal, but I think you mentioned it as maybe a sort of a heat cycle working fluid as well, maybe on one of your slides. So if, if there's anything more yeah. you want to say about that. Yeah, so this is, this is, this is that something that we are doing actually in the US together with Gas Turbine Institute. We're looking into CO2 indeed or the as a as a as a working fluid, so what is called the the alum cycle. Eh? So try to um, try to no longer do a water steam cycle when you combust the gas, but try to um, use the CO2 as a working fluid immediately to uh, to drive your, um, your your turbine if you wish. So there's no more water steam cycle. So if it works, then you can. Um, and this is being tested um, also in Texas eh? by NetPower, for example. Um, then of course the, the, the machines can be smaller, they can ramp up faster and down. So this is something that, that yes, that is something that we are looking at. And of course the advantage that you have is you will have pure CO2 also as your flue gas, 
So there's no capture step needed anymore. So we can do all these things that I talked about with the CO2 from these kinds of installations. Right. Uh, there are two questions I'll put together here. And I think for the first one, maybe you don't have to say much. One is just they're sort of life cycle assessment related since you presented this and NG seems to be doing a lot of thinking and life cycle assessment. So one is about anything expert to say about the nuclear low carbon as a low carbon energy source and the life cycle there. And then the, <clears throat> the second one's a little more detailed thinking about hydrogen and there's some reports coming out about, you know, hydrogen emissions or leaks, if you will, uh, and the effect on global warming potential uh, from that. So have you been looking into hydrogen uh, as a global warming inducing gas and incorporating this into life cycle or anything on that nature? Yeah, so let me take the hydrogen question first. So yes, we are very much well aware of, and actually this was uh, first came out by EDF, Environmental Defense Fund in the, in, in the US, uh, who published a, a report on, on showing that how hydrogen um, could potentially be what they call an indirect global warming potential gas, because um, when, it, when it reaches the higher altitudes, um, it could actually react with, um, uh, with OH radicals, which then are no longer available to actually clean up the atmosphere and, for example, take the methane out. So indirectly, your hydrogen could extend the lifetime of your methane. Um, I think it's very li little doubt, um, scientific doubt, that this mechanism um, is, is not true, is not valid. I think what, what there's a little bit more uncertainty about is how much of this hydrogen actually reaches these um, altitudes where these kind of um, reactions take place. And so to, um, to what we've decided as NG on this is to do two things. First of all, we are not climate scientists, so there we will just follow up what is being produced by, by our atmospheric scientists. But what we will do is as we are building um, hydrogen projects, from the start, we will install hydrogen monitors to really understand how much hydrogen is actually leaking for the, from these, these, these new installations and do a lot more efforts than probably what was done in the past on methane to ensure that we don't have hydrogen leaks. The good thing is, especially for green hydrogen, you don't want it to leak because it's so expensive. You will do everything to make sure that it doesn't leak. The bad news is it's just a small molecule that is really hard also to make sure that it doesn't leak. So, um, so we've just decided that as we start building hydrogen projects to install a lot of sensors everywhere to make sure that we follow up our, our emissions um, and then we leave the real uh, scientific and, and chemical reactions to the people who know about this. Okay. Uh, anything on the nuclear? The nuclear question is just on the, you know the whole life cycle: mining the fuel, refining the fuel, storing the fuel, this kind of thing. And uh, I guess how do you any, anything about the life cycle assessments? Or you I trust the literature cycle, on that? Yeah. We, we know we've done we've done we've done LCAs on that as well. And I think it's with nuclear, it's not so well. Not, it, the upstream part, so the fuel supply chain is is important, of course, and it should be looked at. But I think the main challenge for the knife life cycle assessment of the nuclear is how do you rate your impact categories um, um, uh, be between another? I mean, you will see that you do really well for climate change. Eh? Um, uh, for CO2 emission, the global warming potential is very, very low, usually below 10 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour of electricity leaving these nuclear power plants. But of course, you do have things like um, radiation um, so from your from your fuel waste, and then of course it, it comes to more I would almost dare to say political or personal values. Eh? If you consider now that 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 climate change is the most important or the only um, um, challenge that, that that humanity is facing, then probably doing nuclear is um, is is a good idea, and and you don't take too much or give too much weight to this this this, this waste issue. Now, the truth is also that we don't know very much what to do with this waste for the coming 10,000s of years. So if you think that this is really important, then probably um, you should give more weight to that. So you cannot just add them up and say this one is better, this technology is better than the other one. It depends on a lot on the weight that you give to this uh, environmental impact that, that comes from both. So this is it's not only a politically correct answer, it's also a scientifically correct answer, I think. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, here's a 
question. There's a couple. Well, I'm trying to pick which one to ask. So thanks everyone for asking questions. What uh, is, I'll just go on this one. Uh, any investigations into lithium extraction from seawater? As investigations is a big word. We do have. Uh, we we are running now. Um, a first technology watch study on lithium extraction from our brine, because Angie is very active in, in the Middle East in desalinization. So we've got quite a bit of gas based, but also more and more reverse osmosis uh, based um, desalinization installations, which have, of course, a lot of brine. And there we are looking into would we have technologies to recover lithium out of these brines, not so much in, in uh, seawater itself um, as we speak today. Right. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask this one's a little more on the, the non-technological front, but communications, you kind of mentioned the reports you put out, I guess on an annual basis. And this one's, uh, I will try to phrase. Um, the person's asking, it seems like maybe there's some hurdles or potentially difficulties in scaling a lot of technology uh, with regard to policymakers and communicating this to them. Uh, in some sense, the question is asking, do you find difficulty in communicating some of these ideas to policymakers? And, um, how do you overcome these, or do you find most people get it? Uh, if you have interactions in the United States, maybe versus Europe, maybe there's some differences. I don't know. Yeah. That's a tough question. First of all, I can say the reason why we published this report is exactly for this. Um, it is really to reach out to to anyone there, policymakers, but also colleagues, to help. We do it in a almost a pedagogic pedagogic way to try and really educate the people. It's it's pretty simple. We, in a few slides, we try to explain the technology, be very fair on the opportunities and the challenges left. It's not all the technologies that Engie has in our um, in our uh, uh, portfolio. For example, last year, we, we published a few slides on nuclear fusion. As I said, we're following this from far, but it is important. And it's the reason why we do it is to really educate um, people well, this without being pretentious, but to really share the information um, with with a, a, a wide audience, because indeed, as you say, understanding these kind of, of things is, is is crucial. And there's a lot of hype out there as well. Eh? Out there to say, for example, the hydrogen, um, hydrogen, as as I as I as I as I said, it's it's a very useful molecule, but but probably not for bikes or even for cars. So there's a lot of wrong, almost almost errors versus thermodynamics that are out there. Um, but still, people are, are are talking a lot, and 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 there's a lot of untruth out there as well. So, uh, I think it really helps for us as, as as people who do have a little bit of expertise. We should really help um, understand because it's not always simple. It's not always nothing is binary. It's not one or zero. I like the question on nuclear. Um, it's not this one is always better than this one. It's probably more about which in which conditions under which areas under which does this one make more sense than the other one? It's, it's more those kind of things. Nothing is binary. It seems like today you cannot be and for nuclear and for renewables. You have to choose. It's something that, that I think makes no sense. We should not choose. We should think about where which one makes most sense. Now, now you're starting to pique my interest here in this uh, oh, sorry, yeah. human dynamic versus uh, economic viewpoint. So you're, we, we could follow up uh, for, for a long time on that. Um, I guess I'll ask one, well, maybe there's two questions here that are left. One is, it may be too US, uh, United States centric of a question, but maybe it applies for Europe as well. We have certain restrictions or, or, or perhaps difficulty importing solar panels. We have this big you know, build out of solar around the world. So either from the US or European or global perspective, how you think about it is, do you, do you think that's gonna be a challenge importing enough solar panels to the countries that don't produce them that want to install them and you have any other thoughts on overcoming that? You talked somewhat about this in terms of capacity for mining, but this would be on PV modules. Yeah, well, I think especially for PV, we're doing a study as we speak on this, in fact, because I, I do think it is an issue. Eh? If, if something happens um, in, in China, for example, and China decides to stop um, exporting not only these minerals, because they've got a lot of min minerals and the materials, but also more than 90% of the panels are actually uh, manufactured so assembled also there and shipped as complete panels I think yes I think and Europe is thinking about it that Europe has announced that it will install what is called gigawatt factories for batteries but also for PV now there is the intent to move a lot of the industry back um, in, into Europe because 
yeah, remember a lot of these things started in, in Germany, for example, where among the front runners of PV, today there's hardly still panels being made in, in Germany. They're all shipped out into, into. So yes, and I think I heard in the US the, the same reflections are, are ongoing. Eh? Um, so, but, but even if we decide to manufacture them more here or in the US, we still need the materials, which are for a great, also coming from those places. So we also need to think about how we get access also closer by. So yes, I think this is a, this is a very important um, challenge. Right. Okay. Well, we'll ask one more here and perhaps end on this one, which is a similar question perhaps, but about <clears throat> energy storage or electricity storage and batteries. So can you share any more details about advancements in energy storage and impacts on the grid and maybe it comes down to supply chain issues as much as anything as well. Go ahead. Well, no, there's a supply chain issue, but I won't repeat there. Eh? What is true for for um, for PV is true for batteries. Although the good news is for batteries, it all it only has to start. It's only starting. So maybe there there is a way to do a little bit better than what we did with PV. Um, but but for batteries, I think what you see today, um, and it's a little bit related. There is a drive towards two things. I think first of all, it's towards more safe batteries. Um, we have had a lot of accidents for large scale batteries, for example, but also in electrical vehicles. So you see that people are working on solid state batteries um, or redox flow batteries, for example, which are new types of batteries, um, especially the redox flow batteries, maybe a little bit less um, efficient and certainly less energy dense, but a lot safer. So this is one um, drive you see towards more safe. And then the second one is indeed this more sustainability is how can we do energy storage but get rid of the critical materials. And there again, redox flow batteries are, are, are something that we are also looking at. Eh? So this is more about an oxidal reduction over a membrane than, than having a lot of critical um, metals in them. Um, so this is the second, for example, also the same, even if you stick to the lithium ion batteries, I think Tesla announced a few weeks ago that they will move away from the NMC, so nickel manganese cobalt type of batteries because they contain cobalt and they're annoyed with the cobalt issue. So they are moving now to what is called an older technology, LFP, yeah? so lithium iron phosphate batteries, but at least it's a little bit energy, less energy dense, but it allows them to get rid of this cobalt issue, which, which is annoying to them. So, so you see that there is a drive to more safety, let's say, and I think at the same time also more sustainability. So these are the two things that are happening with batteries. And maybe to end, we don't see any spectacular tenfold increase in energy density in the next few, years coming, I think. So it's much more about, um, of course, energy density stays important and there is progress being made, but I think it's more about safety and sustainability today. Right, that's an interesting, uh, good note to end on that at least one company in this case, Tesla, making technological decisions in, in a thermodynamic or engineering sense, uh, backwards, if you will, but going forwards on other metrics of sustainability. So, uh, well, this has been a pretty wide ranging talk across technology. And uh, I thank you very much for being a part of our energy symposium. So thank you, Jan yeah. Mertens, Chief Science Officer of NG Research, Professor of Ghent University. Uh, Michael, do you have a closing thought? Yeah, Jan, thanks again. Really, you, you show your knowledge. You also show the range of things that NG is working on. I guess it makes sense because NG is a global company. You'd have a view on a range of technologies and locations. So it was really helpful. And I'm sure there'll be some follow-up questions and communications. So really appreciate your time. And I, I was honored to be here, to be very honest. Thank you.